Chimere is a world populated by flora and fauna taken from Earth periodically throughout history, then set loose to evolve independently. In our last episode, we talked about how the portal works and the how and when of its natural harvest. Today, we will be discussing the portal as modern Chimerians understand it, a gateway back and forth from Earth, and one that they control when it is open or closed. This is not a natural change, but one brought about by the first children, the first of Chimera's great civilizations. As with most aspects of these diminutive beings, the origins of the first children are shrouded in mystery. They appear to have shown up rather suddenly in the highlands of Picardia some 15,000 years ago. Many Picardian claim that the first children were always there as a malevolent presence, but there is much more robust archaeological record of humans and descendants of Homo erectus in the giant island, whereas the first children went from no presence at all to being quite widespread in the two mountain ranges, all with fairly specialized tools. Given that they range between two and a half and three feet tall with a mix of childlike and adult features, they stand out amongst remains. Analysis of bone growth show that they came to Picardia with prolonged lives comparable to modern Chimerians. A popular theory is that they originated on an island where they evolved this neotenic traits, a rather common adaptation to island life. No such island has been found, but consistent sediment analysis across the known world shows unprecedented volcanic activity around 15,000 years ago and it is possible that whatever island they originated from is either claimed by the sea or looks quite different today. Whatever their origins, they came to Picardia and were driven to the highlands by the peoples already established there. This is supported by the earliest archaeological site with confident first children remains being a battle between them and the Picardian living in what is now called the Spine. Most of the cave art showing first children in this early age also show them in conflict with the Picardiant. Such an aggressive reaction to a people so easily mistaken for children implies hostilities were started by the first children, a cultural standard which has a lot of precedent given their later history of these peoples. In short, the first children chose violence, and the Picardiant said, works for me. It seems the first children already had proficiency in manipulating the endemic life of Chimere, or magic, when they arrived to Picardia. This proficiency only grew with time. While in the highlands of Picardia, they used magic to expand and modify sloth burrows, building a vast subterranean civilization. Although the populations of Hukugor have since recovered, most of these modern sloths seem to have been more recent arrivals as the first children hunted their contemporary giant sloths nearly, if not completely, to extinction for both meat and their burrows. The first children steadily expanded from this base. The Picardiant fought many brutal battles, proving to be more trouble than the lowlands of Picardia were worth. Knowledge of the first children's powers and limitations with mind control meant that they employed guerrilla tactics, staying out of range and never hesitating for a kill shot. Rather than expand to the lowlands, the first children instead spread to a less densely populated peninsula in the nearby continent of Arvel. Here they incrementally expanded, using magic to control or kill beasts and the peoples in their way. The first children would not make the same mistake that they did with the Picardiant. These people weren't used to the tactics of the first children, and unfortunately were quite vulnerable. The conquest of the peninsula that later became Qajar only took a decade. Once this conquest was complete, they began construction of the Celestial Wall, a monument that isolated the peninsula as it spanned the neck from coast to coast, and the rest of the coastline is predominantly fjords and difficult to cross. Once the region was cleared of competition and beasts, the Golden Age of the First Children began in earnest. The culling of beasts and clearing of forests by the first children throughout the Kajarith Peninsula triggered a harvest by the portal, gathering flora and fauna from North and Central America and replicating them in the lands of the first children. 
Unfortunately, this awakening of the long-dormant portal drew the attention of the first children even more than the influx of new species. They were quick to investigate this unprecedented source of very powerful magic. It didn't take them long to trap the portal, ending the harvest prematurely, and from there they built a floating city around it, powered by magic. With Kajar as their population and agricultural center, the first children invested heavily in understanding the portal. It is not known how, but they not only constructed a device that controlled its opening and closing, but also the direction, so now the portal could bring beings from Chimere to Earth. It was during this golden age that the first children expanded. Their ruins can be found throughout the known world. Although most of their population was in Kajar, they spread far and wide in their search to discover and understand more magic. This is when they created their monstrous homunculi. Before they were horrid merging seemingly for the sake thereof, but now they were built not out of sociopathic whimsy, but for a range of purposes including labor, companionship, art, and entertainment. The process was refined. Unlike colonial and conquering powers in Earth's history, the first children had no need for new resources or territory, and they were quite capable of creating their own enslaved labor force. Their slow growth and very small body size meant that Kajar offered everything they needed in terms of space or resources. Their expansion seems to have been purely driven by wonder. Aside from Picardia, few stood in their way, and even the Picardians became reclusive during this time. Many realms beyond the known world have ruins of the first children. Both the western and northern continents beyond the known world, along with the eastern continent and Kaishel, all have structures that the indigenous peoples avoid, speaking of curses and malevolent guardians. Every Chimeran civilization has some variation of a myth surrounding the children that controlled minds and turned good men into monsters. Some seek to justify the wonders of the first children by claiming that there were two different ancient civilizations, one that were mighty benevolent innovators and the other were cruel parasites of the mind, but the truth is that the first children were both great and terrible. As with their origins, the end of the first children is shrouded in mystery. Whatever happened was quite sudden. They were extinct in the known world in a matter of months, possibly weeks. Some say that they returned to their island home. Others say that they ventured into the stars. A popular theory is that they were slaughtered by their creations, as the homunculi began the age of demons based in Kajar very shortly after the first children disappeared. But this may have simply been a matter of coincidence, with the homunculi making the most of their creator's demise. Most structures built by the first children has been lost to time. It was typical of first children architects to make a hive of magic bound to the structure as its host, and the magic would repair and maintain this structure so that it could endure independently. Once the hive dies, the artifact or structure bends to the conventional tests of time. Since it has been 11,000 years since the first children collapsed, many hives have died off and the relics crumbled to skeletal mockeries, if not consumed altogether. A dozen or so large structures endure, notably the celestial wall that maintains Kajar's isolation from the mainland, and providing the modern Kajarith with a sanctuary they claim was promised by the stars. The whistling door also endured, perhaps because the portal itself supports the hive. Many ages rose and fell after the collapse of the first children. It is said that the Age of Witches included some mages capable of controlling the device, but any solid evidence of this was lost during the Dark Ages. What is known is that a particularly innovative apprentice of a historian from the Free States, which by then had encompassed the floating city of Kabarahar as a city-state for a few centuries, determined how the whistling door operated, even without the use of potent magic. 
From there, the free states dived headfirst into the Mercantile Age, which was a boom of economic prosperity that abruptly ended about half a century later with a devastating plague brought by its trade with Earth. I discuss this plague in more detail in my Pig Day special if you want to know more. When closed, the magic of the portal is contained within its arching frame and the great rings that facilitate three-dimensional replication. The whistling door has earned its name from the sound that the portal makes when it is open but dormant. The magic fills the frame and emits an eerie whistling from the collective millions of microbes hovering thanks to tiny sacks of low-density gas produced by their respiration. They are invisible in this state, although can be seen as a sort of mirage when the swarm is dense. When they spring into activation, either to consume or replicate, this whistle becomes a soft, harrowing scream as the magic swarms through the air towards its target. For reasons unknown, the cloud becomes visible at this time, sometimes ranging from purple to red, although often it remains as a colorless mirage. In its natural state, the portal harvests and replicates more than just the organism in question. It often includes things in the immediate vicinity that the subject needs to survive. This includes gut flora and, unfortunately, disease. Sometimes plants are taken based on what the animal needs, but as the ultimate motivation and priority of the portal is plant health, it's usually the other way around. Minerals are often collected and replicated, particularly those important for plants. When archaic humans were first harvested from Asia in the Middle Pleistocene, their stone tools were sometimes brought with them thanks to this trait. When the first children made the whistling door, they enhanced this function of the portal significantly, which is how clothing, tools, and even small ships can be replicated, something the portal in its natural state wouldn't bother doing beyond perhaps what the person was carrying at the time if they went into the portal thinking deeply on its importance. On Earth, the main hive is trapped in a general range over the Atlantic Ocean between Bermuda, Florida, and Puerto Rico, either under the surface or above the waves. When the device on Chimere sends instructions, they activate in a way making the swarm visible to the human eye, and either replicates whatever enters the whistling door, or consume that which is in the immediate area. When in its natural state, the data took many years to get from Earth to Chimere. By methods unknown, the first children dramatically accelerated this process, and the data can usually get from one end to the other within a few hours to a day. The process of replication takes between a few seconds to a few minutes depending on size and complexity, with consciousness being the last step. Compared to the natural process, which can take up to an hour, this is extremely fast. The device accommodates this energy burst on Chimere, but intense heat emissions are a consequence on the Earth side. Some of this hive are invariably killed in the process. This is part of why the portal now only opens once a year at most, as during the height of the Mercantile Age, the portal on Earth was nearly depleted, although plagues brought from Earth and Chimerans wishing to keep their world a secret also influence these infrequent openings. With the internet making surveillance and communication with the assembly easier, and fears that the surge in whatever the portal is emitting will alert modern humans, some advocate for permanent closure. The Great Portal and the Whistling Door have both shaped Chimere in culture and biology. The world is defined by the whims of this eldritch presence and those who have tried to control it. This control is maintained for now, but many believe that it is a matter of time until the constraints are broken, for the natural world is not known to take kindly to control indefinitely.